We're next going to look at how the internet is being used as a tool for social change. And I'd like to introduce Nanjira Sambuli, who uh, leads the Web Foundation's advocacy efforts uh, to promote digital equality in access to and use of the web. Nanjira is going to be asking whether the internet is supporting the most powerful or the most marginalized. So upon inventing the web, Sir Tim Berners-Lee had the vision that it would be open and for everyone. 28 years later, almost half of the world's population is online. Uh, and some estimates actually say it's more than half. And um, the ITU tells us that young people are at the forefront of internet adoption, that 70% of the world's youth are online. So at surface value, the statistics are encouraging. Um, they help in further making the case that the internet is no longer a luxury. It's no longer a nice to have. Um, and I think that there are, more those, uh, there are more of those who are already convinced about this than those who aren't. But the flip side of this promising outlook is just as important to assess, and it's just as important to go granular. Another way to look at what I just said is that half of the world's population is still offline. That's approximately 3.9 billion people. The majority of those are women. Approximately 2 billion women on, uh, in the world are offline. Women are 50% less likely to be connected when you control for age, income, and education level. And even when they are connected, they are 30 to 50% less likely to use the web for personal empowerment. Furthermore, much as 70% of the world's youth are online, nine out of 10 of those who are not live in Asia, Africa, and the Pacific. So why are they unconnected? The high cost to connect, that is the high cost of devices and data. There's the issue about lack of time and lack of relevant content, lack of digital skills and know-how, as well as the chilling effects, political, social, and legal, that um, keep many of us from even remaining online for those who are connected. Now imagine how that plays out when others see how that plays out for those connected. So what does all this tell us? That um, the adoption of the internet, this core backbone of digital transformation, is still following the same age-old patterns of inequality and unfortunately, it is yet to disrupt them. Um, those historically marginalized, whether it's by gender, by age, by social group, by any grouping or identity, are more likely to also be left behind given how things have been going. And they're not only left behind as consumers, they're left behind as creators, as inventors, as designers of this ecosystem that we all want to contribute to. And Another way to put it is that the web is predominantly for urban male communities or groups, unfortunately. Now, for the web to be for everyone, as Satim Banasli envisioned, we have to take this divide seriously. And we have to assess how do we actually mitigate and get rid of the same old patterns of inequality so that anyone anywhere in this world can actually use the web for personal, economic, social empowerment. What's at stake right now is that the benefits of the internet, as I said, are accruing to those who are either already powerful or who are, you know, depending on the social groupings they belong in, are the ones who are included. And it can't serve as an empowering space unless we know that everyone's rights will also be protected online. And I like that the theme of this afternoon is going to be diving deeper into that, even as other speakers come up. So if half of the world remains offline, and many of those are women. A big chunk also is that how we continue to um, ensure connectivity, we have to make sure we have that in mind and that in focus. So what we need to do, I call it that we need to react. That is, we need a very strong focus on rights, education, affordable access, relevant content, and targets that help us measure who's, uh, how, how we're faring progress-wise. Now. All these are interconnected, and all these are underpinned by the fact that the web needs to become a fundamental right and a public good that everybody can enjoy. Um, if 
again, I, I mentioned the chilling effects that many women cited as why they remain offline. The web simply cannot be an empowering space. We can't continue with business as usual if that continues to be something people feel. I think it will be truly tragic if the legacy of the web and the internet is that the same inequalities, the same injustices were simply transferred. And so first and foremost, right off the bat, even as we're trying to figure out how to connect the unconnected, we have to have a very solid rights regime. And keep in mind that in many, in many communities in the world, even their offline rights are still yet to be enjoyed. So if we're going to be trying to get them connected, how do we make sure that's not yet another space that their rights are abused? Now, education sounds like, yes, we go to class and we sit there, yada, 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 that's great. But it's about also making sure people feel that they know how to use the web. This, became, this came up a lot, actually, in some of the research we did that said that you know, um, people just don't feel like they know how to use the web. Uh, very closely related to that is content, a scarcity of relevant content, and especially in local languages outside of the, you know, the big 10 that are known to be used in the web today. And also that the, the web is predominantly text-based. So what happens to people's, people of other disabilities? What's their web experience? These are some of the questions we need to be asking ourselves as we talk about how to connect they're called the next billion, the next three billion, and it's a sexy topic, but how do, what, do we, what does that actually mean? Um, I wanna focus on the, the one called Target because it will help us understand um, who else needs to be addressing this issue. So with Target, is the idea that, um, for instance, I said two billion women are not connected. Where are they? Uh, what is keeping them offline? How do we measure progress, all our efforts towards collectively making sure that they're actually connected? Now, <laughs> before I go there, I want to mention something about, uh, in March, the web turned 28. And so Tim Berners-Lee penned uh, an article that said he has three major concerns about how the web has progressed. He said that um, we've lost control of our personal data. It's too easy for misinformation to spread online. Political advertising needs transparency and understanding. Now, when I say those, I'm sure you can give me many examples from the, probably from here in the UK as well as the US, but how do these play out in other parts of the world? And I'll give you a story about my country, Kenya, where I'm from and where I work from. And these things have been shaping up in a very interesting way, and you may not see it in global discourse, but it's just as important, these concerns for the web. We're just, I would say we're coming off, but we're still in an election season that has been politically charged, if you've, if you've been following that. But one of the most interesting things has been how the web was also weaponized, so to speak. Now, um, in the in this narratives about tech in Africa, I'm sure you hear about Kenya a lot. Uh, internet adoption rates are at about 89%, which is great. Um, but women still remain marginally con uh, disconnected, so to speak. But it's also a lot of people who are connected are young people, again, in line with what the International Telecommunications Union found. So as we were charging up to this election period, we started to notice that a lot of the people who were trying to vie for office were also getting online. You know, they, it, was, it became a cool campaign thing to say, you know, connected, we can connect online and that kind of thing, which is great. It signaled that they understand that people are not only connected, but if you want to get their message out there, you have to use these platforms. But very quickly, misinformation, propaganda, the whole shebang started playing out. The stark difference, though, is what became called fake news. Uh, in the US and elsewhere, for us was nothing necessarily new in that um, any election season since independence for us has always come with some form of information that is trying to, to just polarize people. The only thing that changed is the platforms that this was being spread in. Previously, it was hate leaflets that would go around or even word of mouth and SMS as well, we were still trying to get connected. So when this thing came online, it was like, okay, it has arrived on this platform. In a way, in a very strange way, it's almost like giving a stamp of approval that the internet is actually a very important site for connection, for everything under the moon, so to speak. So one key difference was that we were not entirely shocked the way you see the narrative shaping up about fake news. And the thing about that term is it's a catch-all term that obviously the orange man has made very impossible to actually constructively have a discussion. Now, <laughs> a survey that was then done said that 90% of Kenyans online were sure they had seen information that was deliberately false. 90% of people who were surveyed, this is a nationally representative survey. It tells you a lot about what people were already ready for. Now, we can read that many ways. We can say that people are already aware that this is something that exists and therefore they would see it online. 
But other inten unintended consequences could have been people would have likely um, elected to stay offline. People were still looking for credible sources of news. Um, now, that kind of polarizing space is just that the same trends that are used offline, t replicating online. But what was also very encouraging is the pushback. And actually, if nothing else, you remember about Kenya. Kenya um, and our adoption of social media or the internet has also been about pushing back and fighting for our rights. So what's been really encouraging about that has been how people were able to call it out one by one. Whether somebody tried to put out a um, BBC-type news item that, you know, Candidate X is the future, this other one is the road to the apocalypse, there's a great ad, um, sense of pushing back. Now... In the narratives that we read about fake news and everything, it's almost all doom and gloom, but I wanted to just say, <laughs> if nothing else, it's still a site. Those sites were still used to fight back and actually even shape the narrative that the media would take on. So in, a, in, in, in media environments globally that are becoming more repressed, in a place like Kenya, what we're seeing is the people who are occupying online spaces are shaping the agenda and forcing media um, entities, whether they are co-opted or whether they just don't want to talk about it, whether they're lazy, to shape the agenda and talk about what people are seeing and what their experiences are. On the issue of political advertising, some of the companies that were said to have been involved in the US election, um, you know, Cambridge Analytica and others, started being mentioned in Kenya as well, which was a bit scary because like, you know, small, well, small-ish country in East Africa, there must be something about the way the web is used that somebody would pay what has been estimated to be about $6 million to get a strategy going to, you know, distract, deploy, get, you know, false, false news, if you want to call it that. Now, that news piece has never really been confirmed. I know Privacy International have tried very hard to, to confirm it, but the narrative took on. But um, that, for me, has been very interesting in the sense that um, it's just something that's out there that we know. We're seeing the Senate uh, hearings in the U.S. that, you know, are trying to get these platforms accountable. And when I've been watching those, I've been wondering, in Kenya, whom would we go to to say we want to know if CA was involved? Um, but we just sort of accepted and moved on, but found ways to be, re to, 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 to be resistant, like just some sort of resistance, because it was something like you see sites, if you do a Google search about the election or a candidate, you are literally directed to sites that try and get, convince you that one candidate is the future and what they've done, or the other one is doom and gloom, the apocalypse, the whole shebang, that kind of thing. So that very polarized environment became very tricky, and especially for young people who consume everything online, many of whom were first-time voters, um, we had over 50% over of those who were going to the, uh, to the vote being young people for the first time. They're trying to inform themselves, but they're already being sent into some sort of like digital farms of misinformation. But in that environment, one thing that came to mind for me is this is a truly a global phenomenon. All these issues we're seeing that we're talking about the di almost dystopic future of the web is not just happening in the US alone or the UK alone. Those stories also need to be told, but there are also stories of brilliant resistance coming in. But the unintended effect of that has been many people now think of the web as a truly polarized space. So it means that even those who've been connected may start rolling it back and just saying, well, what's the point if everything we see is going to be charged, uh, whether it's just Googling the weather and somebody says, well, it's both sunny and rainy at the same time. You know, it's, it's getting to that point where you don't know what to trust anymore. So it's not just unique to what's been happening in the UK. The question is, how do we seek recourse with platforms that are registered elsewhere, um, uh, that are not necessarily bound by the laws of our, of our land, so to speak. Yet people still go to these spaces because it's a site for fighting for their rights. Not just their digital rights, but their very fundamental rights. Just this afternoon I found out that um, just because of the noise people have made online, a directive to cancel, to cancel how many times you can go to a uh, hospital using a national insurance uh, card, uh, sort of like the National Healthcare Service, um, there was a directive that the minister said, you know, it's just going to be four times a year and you can only uh, um, claim up to, I think it was $15. In four hours, outrage alone, on a Saturday, guys, it's been overturned. That's what the power of the spaces that we need to protect has become. It's become a site that's not just about fighting for the digital rights, as I said, but also just the fundamental rights to health, to education, anything under the sun. So, but back to reacting, I'm sure many of us in this room can talk about great work that we're doing towards making sure that the web is for everyone, that the, connect, uh, the unconnected are connected. But there's one group that I know many of us may or may not like to talk about, and that's governments, and what their role is here. Now, I'm convinced that governments have to be involved from the get-go, and it's a 
no small task. But because for those who are unconnected, the primary reason is because of policy failure. And so if it is policy failure that has made 2 billion or 3.9 billion people to remain unconnected, 2 billion of whom are women, it has to take policy as well to, to fix that. Now, statistically speaking, countries that actually have sound ICT policies tend to have higher broadband adoption rates and lower costs of access. Many of us may innovate, we may build, we may, you know, use AI for good, blockchain for good, any technology that comes along to try and address these issues. But fundamentally, if we do not address the role of governments, what they end up continuing to become is just a blocker. We pay taxes, for instance. Why should it then take that I have to wait for a platform or some magnanimous force to come and do the job that they're supposed to do? These are the fundamental questions, even in digital rights as we talk about, that we need to start assessing what's the role of governments. Actually, if I may ask, is there anybody here who works with governments? No, safe space, I think. Just show of hands. I think you're in a safe space. If you've come all the way, you're brave too. No one. Now, we can go, and it's important for us to meet the way we do here and talk about how we're doing our work. But if those people who are, to whom we are giving our resources, who are squandering other public resources, we have public goods, the internet will fail to become a public good if we do not put them to the task. What will, what's at risk right now is we will have rich man's per, uh, versions of the internet, poor people's versions of the internet, and especially in connecting the unconnected, they remain poorer, they remain in marginalized geography, so to speak, and those inequalities could be compounded because if these efforts are not underlined, underlined by sound policies that we all adhere to, that all our contributions feed towards that, we will continue putting people into different areas and the web will be a fragmented, balkanized space. Again, replicating the age-old patterns of inequality. Now, I don't want to talk too much because I want us to dwell a bit more on that. And I want to hear from you. Um, what do you think about the issue of uh, what everybody has to do and how we actually get governments into the room? We have to be careful as digital rights activists and advocates to make sure we're not always stuck in the antagonistic side with the, you know, with the placards outside the room while they make the decisions that continue to affect our lives. But we need to find pragmatic ways, if at all any, we need to innovate around how we, we engage in the policy space because that's the fundamental way we're going to make sure not only are the unconnected connected, but they are connected to the web in its true form, as was envisioned, to be open, to be uh, for everyone, for everybody to be able to enjoy their rights online. And for people anywhere in the world, the Kenyans, the Ugandans, everybody who's just trying to fight out and have their existence count for something, actually do that and contribute to a healthy internet. Thank you. Question time. Just a quick, on, on, as you mentioned Kenya, I understand the main problem, Ken, you mentioned the poor people, is the astronomical cost of getting the internet. Right. Um, is, is this true? I forget how many dollars, but incredible amount of money that 99% of Kenyans can't afford. Right, and it's not just unique to Kenya. So a country like Kenya becomes interesting because at surface value, 86% internet penetration rate sounds great. But when it comes to who's remaining unconnected and the cost, as you said, those things compile and make people just won't prioritize it. And that's where the role of government should be because they sit on resources that could ensure that where the market doesn't go, as private companies, they could go in there and offer subsidized access to the whole web. So it shouldn't be up to a, one company to come with their solution and keep people in that platform. As uh, many of you may have heard, many people in many uh, developing nations say Facebook is the internet because simply it is the first point of contact. If we continue with that, and then it becomes platform X is the internet, platform Y is the internet, are we all really existing in the same space? So these are some of the questions, and that's why I said it's also just as important to talk about governments and their role. Yeah, BBC covered on the 2nd of August the theme of Cambridge Analytica in Kenya. Mm -hmm. They covered in extreme detail, saying where the office is in Nairobi and so on. So it is something that is widely known. Yeah. The, the issue is, in the US, for example, if you put any kind of political advertisement, even a leaflet, you have to say who paid for that. And nobody's asking US companies like Facebook 
to say mm -hmm. this was paid by whom. Now, they are proposing a self-regulation thing. What do you think from a web point of view? <laughs> Personally, I think these hearings that are going on are going to be very interesting in terms of what the U.S. government suggests as a way forth, but how applicable that will be to the rest of the world and how existing laws in those countries. And this, these are some of the challenges about what we would call our digital citizenship, which laws dictate that. You know, um, but yes, transparency should be important in that case. Also, maybe, but <laughs> like in, I'm trying to think, for instance, whether it would have carried that CA uh, angle. But it also ties to the fact that in Kenya, um, you can the government has also been accused of using state resources to run ads on on TV and radio. So the question becomes that's the main platform of information, what about the internet? But you're right, there needs to be a bit more creativity around the transparency of those, um, starting with what you guys do. Uh, the other thing I should say, what, what happens a lot in the US and the UK also resonates very well. So if you get this stuff right, you give us all momentum to do it as well. Where are the women? <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, I didn't mean to discredit you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're with the World Wide Web Foundation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be using being online and being on the web interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But as you just mentioned a minute ago, there are a lot of people, especially in developing countries, who uh, see Facebook as the internet. They, they're not really aware of anything outside Facebook. Is that a concern to you? And if so, uh, what can we do to ensure that people keep using the web outside of Facebook, outside of Twitter? One thing I, I, I preoccupy myself with, and we do as a, an organization, is what, a, what would you call as a fundamental uh, entry point so that it's not your, you know, you sort of enter, like, think of the, in, um, the internet or the web as a plane and you're, you know, you're directed either to first class or to coach. Um, and how do we make sure that you first understand there's a plane that you're in, the safety rules are this and that and that. Here are the terms of engagement. You have a space to create if you could hack a plane, so to speak. But um, that's been a big concern for us. And that's why, again, we have been asking what's, who should be able to say, even if it's Facebook, for instance, that is rolling out infrastructure, whether it's Wi-Fi, whether it's when you buy a phone, it's a first and only app, that there's certain, uh, certain principles that they must adhere to that are not just about keeping people on their platform. And on one hand, it does entail engaging with them to listen, but on the other hand, it's making sure that we have sound policies that are non-negotiable as far as the open web goes. Uh, and it's a huge issue. Right now, you find that um, even with the support that goes to innovation in global south areas, it's all about building on top of what has already been built. So the agency to also create the same way the World Wide Web and other platforms that have been created is being lost. So you come onto the internet primarily as a consumer. All these are issues that we're trying to push back on and figuring out what's the right way to make sure anyone has, everybody has all agency that Facebook had when they created their platform. Um, the Web Foundation does a great job of highlighting problems in uh, developing countries with internet access, and this is a great example of that. Um, I was interested in success stories or possible success stories. What about um, partnership efforts, perhaps with people like Audrey Tang, who we saw earlier, um, and perhaps the One Laptop Per Child initiative, mm -hmm. which started about 10 years ago, not only to provide access to computers, but also to provide access to the internet using innovative mesh networking so that even if there was only one point of presence mm -hmm. in the region, lots of people in nearby villages, etc., would still have access. Are, are those success stories actually kind of bearing fruit? Are sh they working? I should have added that my, my job title is also Debbie Downer. But <laughs> on One Laptop for Child, um, in, I think in Uruguay, where it initially started, it may, it may have taken off, but when they adopted it in countries like Kenya and Rwanda, well, it became an, a very expensive failure that is trying to be corrected after the fact because the fundamentals were not figured. So they wanted to roll out uh, any child enrolling to school gets a laptop, which became a tablet in the case of Kenya, to be able to, to, to take, um, you know, to, to create and all that. But teachers had not been trained. 
electricity had not been rolled out in many of the schools, so those, laptop, uh, those tablets would die out. So one thing that became clear after the fact is you have to have all the other offline infrastructure in order for a program like that to work. But I do have an encouraging story. <laughs> um, and something else around actually connecting the unconnected, and specifically women. In Costa Rica, they, they use this uh, resource called the Universal Service Fund, which is usually what uh, telecommunication uh, companies are required to contribute uh, an amount of their gross tax, as well as governments putting in money. So it's a kitty that goes to making sure that where the market cannot uh, cater to communities, the government can go out and roll out some infrastructure. So in, in uh, Costa Rica, what they did is they used that fund to give subsidies to low-income households to buy uh, to get access to fixed bandwidth and to a computer. And they were responding to the fact that 95% of low-income households are actually led by women. So in that form, they were able to not only connect the unconnected, but also to, to, to start closing the digital gender gap. And today, Costa Rica is one of the countries we find has done great, taken great strides in closing the digital gender gap as we speak of it. So um, in, one thing I should say is innovation is great. And we all have to keep innovating. But the fact of the matter is we will not innovate our way out of bad public policy. We'll have a few moonshots, but that is just to exist in a false security. Because the more we leave that space, the more it compounds in complexity. So that one laptop per child becomes about electricity missing out because universal access to energy was not sorted out, or health, or any other service. I hope that gives you a sense of how that plays out. And it's not fun. It's not sexy. <laughs> but it's what it is. <laughs> Um, hi, didn't, I've done quite a lot of work with families in poverty about not just literacy, but online literacy as well. And I don't think, geographically speaking, it matters where you are. If you're not literate and you don't fully understand that there are the, these negative influences, yeah. you are going to be sucked down the rabbit hole as soon as you go online, particularly with social media, particularly with mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, given that we've had that trouble in the area I'm from and you know, um, we've got real problems with adult illiteracy in the, digit in the analog world, let alone digital world. How is it that we, this can be addressed globally in a more equal way to give everybody the kind of decent first start, as it were, to right. give them the building blocks to then work with once they get online? No easy answers there, I, uh, but one of the things we recommend is that um, digital literacy has to be embedded in uh, ed education systems, so right from primary, secondary to tertiary, but as you were saying, with adult illiteracy, we need programs that are inclusive on that front. The, one of the problems I've seen is, especially in regions where people, there are compounded inequalities, the solutions are always one meal. So if I go in for uh, training on literacy, just basic literacy as an adult, then I have to be signed up for another for digital literacy, then another for God knows what. Um, and so how do we start making all those come together and actually come up to the times that the, the, we're living in an interconnected world? When I go in for a program, it's actually incorporating many of this, uh, I guess, I issues so that it's not just the literacy thing, it's also how do I create for it, right, in local languages. Literacy should not just be defined as speaking English or French and all that. So there's so many other things that are compounding. So there has to be a lot of time spent in designing interventions with all these issues in mind. And very importantly, consulting with those whom we say we're designing for. So we can sit here and think, oh yeah, adult illiteracy, so bad, so bad, so bad. Let's just, you know, build an app for it. But who said that's what those people needed? And the more, and it takes time and it takes resources to consult communities, but we absolutely have to. Same way I tell people, I can come here, I can't say I speak for all Kenyans. I can't even say, I can't even tell you I know what percentage of Kenyans I speak for. But if there are other people we need to speak to outside of urban areas, we have to find the time to actually engage them so that they're also co-creators and co-designers. Um, yeah, we still have time? Okay, great. Hi. Um, so I think what you were saying about the responsibility of the government to recognize their role in digital democracy is really, really important. Um, and it slightly links into what Audrey Tang was saying as well about the radical uh, transparency of governments. Um, but what I find interesting is when you look at the governments that are so established and so deeply entrenched in their ways, this seems to require a culture shift. Yeah. And my question is, how do we start to start to get that ball rolling and start to actually create that culture shift. Right. I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, we need a toolbox of tactics. So on one hand, I find it's quite encouraging that many governments just don't know what the hell is digital anything. 
So there's opportunity to start with proactive engagement, if you will. You know, Audrey is, an, is a unique example of somebody who've come, who's come from this community and somehow managed to secure a space where he's not just included, but he's actually able to shift things. That may work in some cases. In others, we do have to uh, you know, bring in other rights groups, traditional human rights groups, to figure out how have they made progress with anything from gender-based violence to education, illiteracy, and all that, so that they also become allies in this kind of work. So it's a toolbox of strategies, but at the end of the day, however we design um, initiatives, we have to be very cognizant of that con country context, and also that there's no one size fits all. Um, so hopefully we can meet at the next OrgCon and come with more tools and strategies that have worked, and everybody can figure out how that can be applicable in their context. But it takes time, but it also takes people trying to do something differently. Right. <laughs> yep. Uh, so your views on uh, net, net neutrality and the threats to it, mm -hmm. because I understand there's a very big threat at the moment in the United States. I'm yeah. not sure what impact that would have worldwide. I know that um, there is not equal net neutrality throughout the EU, uh, and uh, I wondered what your experience was on this matter. Right. Um, no, it's true. Uh, much as the spotlight has been on the US and a bit on maybe the EU, one of the things we've been trying to do is ensure that as many country policies are being written in the Global South, we sneak in that clause. And that's why you have to work with governments, make sure you sneak in something that you can go back and say, oops, sorry, guys, you already <laughs> submitted to this. Um, and it's there's also the question people, and this is a development trap, as I call it, where people just say some internet is better than none. Some internet for poor people is better than none. The analogy that will be used is if you have bread, white bread or no bread, and you're hungry, what will you take? That's how that argument is starting to shape out in other parts of the world. And we're trying to say that it should not be that rights are a cascaded thing, that it's impossible, for, especially in, in developing countries, to get it all right at the same time at the entry point. And again, I think it underpins the role of why we are trying to make sure we work with government um, to make sure they have the sound policies, because then you can go back and say, well, if you're trying to balkanize the web, you actually already have this in your law or something that will build into law, so that gives momentum for where we need to use legislative instruments. So there's still room. I actually am quite hopeful that if we get if we understand the role of policy right in countries that are just starting to figure out uh, policies that will drive the digital transformation, we can ensure those clauses are baked into the practice of how the internet is rolled out, but also not falling for the trap that, you know, if Facebook or whatever platform has come and said, well, we can help you roll out the internet, but it's for your platform alone, people are also aware that that is not necessarily a good thing. We have to counter the Facebook is the internet narrative. So it's on two fronts, but we're trying our best to make sure that that is also baked in and following the U.S. issue quite closely. Uh, this, yes, this gentleman, and then I think it would not be fair to not finish with this what I, gentleman. What I would like to talk about is the aspect you've uh, commented about organizations and what organizations can do. That's only um, a part of it. Mm -hmm. If you think what happened in this country, we started... Uh, in the 1970s with very few computers in schools or anything like that. And what happened here and what made it really take off was when individuals started to share their knowledge, how to make this kit work, uh, turning up at schools, uh, enthusing the kids. So it wasn't the teaching and the organization that did all of that. It was enthusiasts who got involved with the educational process. Now, that doesn't cost money. And the other aspect of it is, um, in the very early days, there was a school called Starehe School in Nairobi, um, where they started off. And um, what happened was a, a few people got computers, and they started to spread amongst one another the, the knowledge about how to make it all work. Now, we have mobile phones in place of computers, but we still have computers because they're part of the educational system. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you have to think this through at the level of maybe the village or the local community. A community has always been able to afford a resource, whether it's a water tap or whatever it is. And a, a computer is just another resource. And if everybody's got mobile phones because they like talking, um, but the thing is you've got to have the atmosphere in the system that everybody starts sharing how to do it. 
and all these things that somebody says, I have found out how to do this this week. And it happens that it wasn't Facebook, it was somewhere else. Now that sort of thing should be shared. Now that approach, which is a, an enthusiast approach, I would like to promote. This gentleman has been waiting. But all I'll say to that is that it's not the innovation and enthusiasm that's lacking. It's actually about what makes it sustainable. Um, but I'll, let's see if time allows for me to give more context to that. Uh, thanks so much, Dada. Uh, I'm trying to talk about uh, the, to split us asunder the myth that the official press or media in the West is a real free expression of ideas. It is not. Because whatever you are trying to do on the internet, it is that the internet is played to everybody so that everybody has an opinion of his own and can educate other people so that at any point that is oppositional or at, in the conflict with another can be understood and some truth can, out, can come out of that. And that's why I think the access to internet is very essential because with that's when you can put pressure on the government and change their policies. What I am trying to tell you is that the problem is the BBC here, for which I pay less fee, is the ideological driven has its own ideolo I mean, policy so that nobody, even me, cannot be there to address my concerns as a taxpayer. And that's what you must be warned about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So just in wrapping up, at the end of the day, we we'll innovate on one side. But the, for this innovations to actually make sure the web is for everyone, we cannot ignore the role of policy. Thank you so much for your attention. And you can keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs>